Thank you very much um, for the venue and, and for an opportunity to, to speak on, on the subject that's, that's uh, it's a little bit different, the way to interpret the world and to interpret the possibility that blockchain has for us. Um, we approach it from a different angle and the implications of this new angle might surprise you. Um, so we'll just get through this here. Uh, our first slide is uh, storage of value in infrastructure. That is the title of this presentation. Um, we store value in gold, we store value in debt, um, and if you look at the you know, common economic textbook, they'll tell you straight up on the first chapter, there's three places that a country stores value, debt, gold, and infrastructure. But there's very little discussion about storing value in infrastructure and how to do it. Okay, it's not an easy thing to do. So we, we have this, this road to somewhere is how I title that picture, and that's what blockchain is, a road to somewhere. So a brief history of IEBC, uh, we started uh, about 25 years ago uh, with NAFTA. We worked on the NAFTA Mutual Recognition Document, and that was an attempt to trade services in the same way that you would trade goods. It, it came out about the same time as the internet, so you had this medium for exchanging these services, and that was all brand new to the world. Um, and then uh, we saw what worked, what didn't work. And then Boeing, we were working, I was working there, and there was a knowledge transfer um, application where they had the senior engineers and the junior engineers and very little in between. They had to get them to exchange knowledge. How do you do that? Well, we set up a market. In order to do that, you have to have a market. You can't just shove the knowledge down people's throats. It doesn't work. So I mean, by setting up a market, you can see this exchange occur, and there's a certain thing you have to do in order to accomplish that. Social flights uh, was, um, we was a ride-sharing platform for, for private jets. It's like an Uber for private jets. And that was a very complicated, highly regulated industry. And the, the problem there, what we learned was that you can't solve the problem in a very discreet manner, but you can solve it in terms of probabilities. And if you have the probabilities out there, you have the, the production function, you have your time functions, then you can use mathematics to solve these project problems. So that was another thing that, that worked with us. Um, the other, uh, I, I was also running the Genesis project, and we were talking a lot about you know, the social currencies. This is that, that phase after social media and before blockchain, there was this, this sort of this movement in between social media and blockchain where there was a lot of uh, ideas about social currencies and, and uh, co-ops were making a comeback. This is all kind of reminiscent of the intentional communities that we, that we saw in the 1960s. I was a member of one, and it was a truly, they had their own currencies and decentralized. That's what it looked a lot like the Dow back then. So that, was, that kind of stuck with me. Um, in 2015, we wrote the white paper for the National Society of Professional Engineers from their FinTech uh, Task Force position paper for the engineers in the United States. And then we, uh, we, we worked with the national, we wrote a position paper for the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. We won the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers Grand Challenge Contest. We formed the Integrated Engineering Blockchain Consortium. We partnered with Blockhouse Investments in Zurich. They've been extremely helpful f with us. And then co-engineers, we just launched our first, our personal, our native blockchain. It's the first blockchain for engineers by engineers. Um, so here's some fun facts. Everybody knows this. 100 years ago, Bitcoin, if you bought $100 worth of Bitcoin in uh, 2010, it'd be worth $7 million. Don't really have to go through these, except this is interesting. The fintech-backed VC in 2017 was about $16.5 billion. The fintech-backed, I'm uh, sorry, the insurtech VC-backed investments in 2017 were 2.3, but for EngTech, that's engineering technology, that's um, computers enabling engineering technology, there was almost zero VC investment. So this is just a staggering omission. I mean, we're, we're sitting here, and it's probably a couple of hundred tons of concrete sort of bouncing over our head right now. We, we, we just don't even think about that. I mean, it's not even an issue. And when you get on an airplane, you know, there's never a thought. It's so when we talk about engineering, how it's in the, uh, all the value which is embedded in engineering, which is never discussed or never measured into existence, there's there's an opportunity for some of us. Um, so this here is this little picture. That's an electron. Uh, that's where cryptocurrency is. It's an electron. It doesn't even have any mass. It's a it's a it's a state of of, of being. It's, it's nothing. It spins. It's cool, but you know, is it intrinsic? No, no, it's not. And that's kind of where a lot of these cryptocurrencies are falling off the table these days. Um, there's a definition of blockchain. Everybody is probably familiar with this one. Decentralized, distributed, records, transactions can't be altered without subsequent blocks and inclusion of the network. That's your Wikipedia definition. My definition is a little nuanced, but it's a clumsy little dance 
that a computer needs to do in order to simulate something that humans have been doing for thousands of years. Okay, so it's not about the tech, it's about the social agreement, the social consensus, not the computer consensus. So this is one of the big focuses we're trying to get at. And, you know, I, I had this little guy here in a robot, and we look at the robot and say, wow, it's really cool, you can envision it bringing you breakfast, you can, you can anthropomorphize your, you know, humanity on this machine, but really the best way to solve that problem is with an elevator. Um, not making something that looks like a human go do the job. So you, you can kind of see how our emotions get wrapped up in, in, in things that remind us of ourselves. Um, what problem does blockchain solve? It solves the handshake problem. Um, I, do I do a demonstration with me? Always. Okay. 1500s, we're in the marketplace. He's got corn, I've got a chicken. Okay, I'm going to trade him my chicken. He's going to trade me his food. We put it on the table. He's going to make sure the chicken's alive. I'm going to make sure the corn is, is not, doesn't have bugs in it. We have a consensus. Now we can let go of hands because he's not going to run. Sweet. That's one reason for the handshake. Whether that's true or not, I'm not actually sure. But it's a great demonstration, and you all saw it. So it would be very difficult for me to reverse that transaction. Okay, so computers are really good at copying stuff, but they're really, really bad at not copying stuff. So that big dance of a blockchain is to get a computer to not copy the stuff. And, you know, it's, it's one way of looking at it. So that's the problem that, that it solves, but it's a huge problem. And it's a very, the implications of the problem are, are magnificent. Uh, just solving that problem in the computer opens up the world to a lot of different things. Um, let's talk about money. Uh, the world did not begin with $83 trillion sitting in a box in the desert someplace. It did not begin that way. In fact, what we did was we measured that value into existence over time. Okay, so that proves that we can literally measure money into existence. It's been done. It has been done. There's nothing that says it can't be done again. So I'm going to talk about a few of these points along the curve. Um, the first point is uh, the heliocentric universe. Um, at the time, if you looked at the Earth and the Moon and the Sun, you didn't have enough information to discern who was going around whom. Okay, until, until you made the assumption that the stars were in fact stationary. And then you can compare the difference between the stars and the object, and that would help you discern what was happening. So it was the inclusion of that other force, that, that stars, and a time function, because things are moving with respect to time. So this is the thing that um, Copernicus gave us. And now that time function led to a science called calculus, the scientific method. We can now navigate weather, we can navigate the planet, we understand tides, and, and gravity, and mass, and finance, and and all the, the mathematics behind finance insurance were created because of that simple observation and because of the inclusion of a time function. So we're saying that the blockchain provides us with that, a time function from which we can compare all these other events that are seemingly non-related. Okay? So this is, um, so you see all the changes that were made since um, Copernicus made this observation. Imagine all the changes that are available to humanity given the ability to use a blockchain as a time function. Um, another guy was Eli Whitney, okay? He was the guy who came with this idea of interchangeable parts. He, he demonstrated that he could take 10 muskets, disassemble all the pieces, and reassemble them into 10 working muskets. The way he did that was it was a problem of systemic risk. What he did was he removed the risk in each, and risk means variance, it doesn't mean bad stuff happened, it means variance. So he removed the variance in the size of these pieces so that one would always fit the other. By removing systemic risk, he was able to, um, to accomplish this task, but this changed everything. It's like Copernicus, it, it, new ways of, of manufacturing things, new ways of growing uh, the assembly lines, the, the industrial revolution, all were sourced from this type of idea. For Jules Verne, he looked at the gun and said, well, we could shoot ourselves into space with that thing. And that, you know, instigated this idea of a going to the moon. And ever since then, we did go to the moon. And gosh, we found it to be a pretty dark and dusty and cold place. Not much use there. But getting there, you know, resulted in the integrated circuit. It resulted in even the blockchain itself because of the introduction of voting computers, which happened on the space program. So these are the sorts of how we got here from just to just demonstrating two simple ideas. Now, if I just go back to, I'm just going to go back to this chart here and show you.
So we just did C and D, and now we want to look at what's E show um, unfold for us. So there's two primary use kit classes, I call them, for, for blockchain. One is the mechanization. Uh, so you can mechanize things and um, call the back office. There's a lot of utility in that. I mean, nobody's going to say that they want to bring back the typing pool, obviously, because uh, word processors were invented. And everybody kind of moved up the scale and became word processing uh, jobs, and so they all got better jobs. And then this other one, and that's, that's important. Uh, there's some dangers to that, though. And uh, in order to avoid those dangers, you must have this other one, organizing events with respect to time. And this is where the new to the world applications are going to come from, it comes from here. What I mean by warning is that, you know, Eli Whitney, he also created the cotton gin. Now the cotton gin was a way to make cotton more profitable. And as cotton became more profitable, the slave trade just went nuts. And then it, it became such a big political issue, it should have been a long time ago, there's probably a better way to do it, but they fought a war. And, of course, Eli was there to supply the guns for that war. And, you know, you can kind of see where his profound innovation is, was, had tremendous impact on society. But there has to be a better way of coming to that conclusion. I mean, I'm sorry. You don't have to fight a war to create stuff, okay? It doesn't make sense. Unless you have another force acting, we could be into some trouble. And I think um, there's some large companies who are worried about um, you know, hollowing out their knowledge base. If you were to, you know, to go directly, skipping a whole generation, like putting everything on the internet, skipping a whole generation, you, you hollow out your management, the, the people you need to be managers in the future. So we've seen those arguments as well. So this is um, the blockchain number two, is the, is the one that we really think is interesting. Organizing events with respect to time, it's like this huge metronome that everybody can synchronize themselves to. It provides a mathematical time function. You can do calculus on these events that you could never analyze in the past. Um, so it's a production function, the systemic risk, and you can also use quantitative analysis. That's the same math that Wall Street use, uses. Um, they hire physicists to do that. Well, the reason why is because that is a universal uh, mathematics, and it requires a time function. So um, we look at where we are today, and you've got you've everybody seen these, these big platforms, right? The Ubers and, and Airbnbs, and um, what well, Alibaba is worth about 500 billion now. Of, Apple's over a trillion, Google's about 850 billion. I mean, how does that work? Okay, so you could probably rewrite their code for a you know, couple hundred million, but they're not being valued against their replacement costs. They're being valued against the communities that they bring together. So they're extracting value, or their, their valuation is contingent on the number of people in that network, the size of the network. And, it's, and the share price is reflected in the number of people squared. It's called Metcalfe's Law. And that's, that's um, that's a new way of measuring value. I mean, because if you just look at Google, if you put in the same cap M valuation, for example, it's the replacement cost is just you know, a couple hundred million bucks. But when you put it in this new way of measuring value, like you remember that chart that goes like this, remember measuring value? This, um, they have these staggering, uh, these staggering uh, valuations. Now they're called, the, a lot of say the platform is like a bridge which connects two groups of people so they can interact and they can have parties and they can have soccer matches and they can go to each other's wedding and they can have these classes and learn from each other and iterate. Um, and so they call platforms and these platforms have real value and they're like bridges so why not do that with a real bridge? And this is where we get into the idea of storing value in infrastructure because the replacement cost of that bridge is one number but the, but the, um, but the network value of that bridge could very well be another number. And to be able to measure that into existence will create, it's just revealing wealth. And I'll show you how that plays out. Um, well, infrastructure is the platform upon which we utterly depend. So if there's any problem about reaching a consensus over the value of this stuff, that shouldn't be an issue. If there's any problem about achieving a, a mutualized reciprocity among people who are trading a token which represents infrastructure, that should not be a problem. Those are given. We need this. We need this. This is stuff that people need. Um, Dr. Robert Solo, he's a Nobel laureate, professor emeritus at MIT. He, um, he studied the contribution of technological change and economic growth. And he, interestingly enough, he introduced a time function which, which he called uh, vintage labor. And I'll, I'll talk about that some other time. Uh, but he estimated that around 80% of economic growth was due to technological change, to innovation. And that that value was incorrectly being attributed to land 
labor, and capital. Those are the, the economic principles from you know, Adam Smith and David Ricardo from which, we, we've, from which we've measured all that value into existence through this, this archaic uh, system. Um, and the problem is that uh, I'll keep this is vintage capital vision. So classical factors of production, land labor of capital, these are the inputs from which all outputs are derived, and this goes into calculating the GDP function I showed you earlier. Um, and the reason why is because these things are very easy to measure. Okay, you think about it, you know, 200 years ago, you didn't have, you know, the measurement equipment, you can't, you don't have any, any LIDAR to see what's growing, what's not yet. Uh, you had to be able to count the people working. You, you put square around the land, and, and, and the capital was denominated in, in these tokens, if you will. So it was very easy to measure, and that's how we got where we are, because of something that was easy to measure. Well, suppose we could measure the hard stuff now. We couldn't before, but suppose the blockchain allows us to measure the tough stuff. Can we, in fact, create new wealth, create new money, create new value, measure value into existence? Why are we broke? It makes no sense. Um, so we look at GDP, and GDP covers things like babysitter, um, the productions we, we think we, we build, the things we make, paid services land development, but it doesn't cover motherhood. And I'm pretty sure that motherhood's responsible for every taxpayer that ever lived. But it is not there. Kindness and empathy. You cannot run a business without kindness and empathy. Period. You can have all the land labor capital you want, but you go in there, it, it, it's not going to work. Um, innovation. How do, you, how do you measure innovation? There's just no way to do that. You can't measure directly. Um, sustainability, and charity, self-preparation. If I make the sandwich, it doesn't go on GDP. But if I go to the restaurant and they make the sandwich, it goes on GDP, even if I don't eat the sandwich. So that just gives you an idea of how arbitrary our money creation device is. And, and maybe it's, it, that itself is subject to um, uh, disruption. So what if we could measure those intangibles? I mean, just, just a question. So the value of engineering is invisible. So when we look at a fireman, um, a fireman is, uh, measured, the value of a fireman is measured by the, uh, by the ferocity of the fire. It's not to say they're useless, but when they do fight a fire, they're worth like a million dollars an hour saving lives and property. I mean, it's, it's fairly obvious. But when they're not fighting fires, then they're preparing to save other people to do, do important work. But you need to fire in order to, to measure the value of the fireman. But if you have an engineer who designs a building that will never burn, and the fire doesn't happen, is that engineer worthless? I mean, these are things that just don't make sense. And no, the engineer is not worthless. If that fire never happens, if that airplane never crashes, if, if, that, if this building never falls, um, the value of the engineer is, is enormous. And the ability to measure them into existence is a, a huge opportunity. Um, what do engineers do? Engineers remove risk from systems. That's all we do. And I'm a licensed professional engineer. I'm measured in several states. And we would look at a building like this, and I would look at, you know, where's the risk? How can I reduce the likelihood that something's going to go wrong? Um, and then we continually do this until nothing goes wrong anymore. So we're removing risk from the system. Now, risk is a really easy thing to measure. Okay, we're talking about measuring value into existence. Risk is super easy, a little bit technical, but it's really easy to measure. You just have to identify the risk exposure, you have to determine the probability, and that has to be a real number with a real time function, again. You hear me use that term again and again, because it's important. Um, but we have to determine the probability that that peril will manifest. And once it does, we have to assess, okay, what's, what's the consequences should it manifest? And this is how you price risk. This is how you articulate risk. Now these are easy things to solve. There's people doing it all day long. Banks, insurance companies, engineering firms, they all trade in the same commodity, and that's risk. So you would think that they have a lot in common. In fact, they do. This is the virtuous circle of economic development. Um, you have a condition up there, and we've learned this in NAFTA. Uh, I could go, it's an amazing story. But you know, the reason why the country was backwards was not because of the engineers or because of the banks. Um, it was because of the insurance. There was holes in the insurance. You couldn't insure um, the road in between two production facilities, so you couldn't get a third-party investor in there. Even though the two production facilities were fine, it was a road, so there's holes in the insurance, and that's one thing that we learned, that a bank will not lend money unless the asset is insured. An insurance company will not insure an asset unless it's properly engineered. And the proper engineering must be financed because it's happening long before 
the object is, is creating revenue. So it has to be financed, you have to pay for it in advance. So this is the virtuous circle of economic development. And from this, we create a new factor of production based on systemic risk. So with blockchain, we can bypass, I mean, just literally step, not kill it, not destroy it, not make it bad or wrong, but just step to the side and create another alternate economy. So we can bypass land, labor, and capital by measuring the risk removed from socioeconomic systems. And um, this aggregate production function is you know, financial risk, insurance risk, and engineering risk. We think that with these three numbers, we can create anything. We can price anything, we can insure anything, we can bet on anything, um, except if you're reducing risk, then the priorities change. You wouldn't have a Flint, Michigan, because that's a very high risk condition. That would be the best opportunity to make tokens, is where there's already high risk. So it kind of flips everything, kind of reverses everything, and that's how we get more towards a, a sustainable economy. Um, so the blockchain we created, it's very, very simple. Um, the engineer makes a claim, another engineer will validate the claim, and then once they're, they're, they're claimed and validated, they're married. So that, that forms the knowledge asset. That's called the unit, um, unit asset. And all these unit assets to built together are what create things that are useful. And that goes on to a production function, and that allows us to have big ideas like Copernicus and big ideas like um, Eli Whitney, and we could just move on. So the idea is not to, um, okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about here. Um, I debated putting this on, it's, it's pretty stark, but you know, it's just a global debt, it's not an America debt, so I'm not picking on Americans, but um, the world owes itself three times more money than exists. And you know, I wish, I wish I didn't know math. I mean, I wish I didn't know what this means. Um, something's gotta give, and we know what that looks like. We've seen it, I saw it in Mexico with the devaluation of the currency, it was, it was just horrific. It's happening in, in Venezuela, it happened in, in, in Germany, in Chile, in, in Argentina. Um, it's never fun, but something has to happen. But why do we have to go through a calamity process? Why can't we just, as this the economic system is falling, why don't we just slowly build one next to it, which hedges the other one directly? So that when one goes off, then the other one, it's not about redistributing wealth or sticking it to the man. It's about, you know, let's just kind of build another one and next to it and let's all use it kind of, and maybe we can get out of it with a minimum amount of damage. You know, we don't have to have uh, calamity and, and, and hardship in order to come up with a new, new way of doing things. Um, so our job now is, this is what our job is for, for engineers. We have to reconcile the physical world with the virtual world. Um, it's no, no, no uh, secret that things are on the internet scale. So you get a lot of venture capitalists just saying, how do you scale? Show me your scale. It's all on the internet. You show me your virtual. Show me your virtual. I don't want to talk about the real. And you get these, um, you know, the internet of things and, and smart contracts and, and, and uh, artificial intelligence. These are all in the bucket of the digital twin, something called a digital twin. We're building digital twins of, of buildings, of, of climates, of, of everything. If one bit of information is wrong, if it doesn't sync with reality, then that digital twin they, it gets propagated throughout, and you get really, really bad data. And we've got this propensity to fake news. How dangerous is that to implicating uh, 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 artificial intelligence programs? So artificial intelligence says, I've, my body of experts say this is going to happen, and now the artificial intelligence can go off and make predictions. How do you know that body of, of, of experts is, in fact, a body of experts? You, you just don't know these things. So you always have to verify things in the physical space. So um, we have to shift our role from brokers, and a lot of, we're, we're brokers, we bring people together. We gotta shift that to the role of adjudicator. We cannot cede blockchain to computers. We have to have a human, like you, I think you mentioned, there has to be a human adjudicator in place at the points where risk is transferred from one person to another person. This is where you want a human adjudicator. Okay, so this is, I don't want to get too deep into it, but that's the, that's the thesis that we're, we're holding forward. Um, so this is, this is where we are, and this is what we have to secure. That's the job that's ahead of us, that point in the middle. Um, here is, uh, I think um, this audience is a little more technical, so I can go into this. We're, we're, we're cloning Steam, which is a, a block one base. It's the same environment as EOS, and uh, we know that community very well. And Steam, we saw it grow. It's, it's got problems, but we're modifying it heavily. Um, but it has two things. We're using two tokens. One is called mass, the other one's called gravity. So if I, if I make a claim, I'm an engineer, I make a claim, I receive mass, 
if another engineer is to verify that claim for which they receive gravity. So the mass can be exchanged on exchange, but the gravity becomes your reputation. He creates two databases. One is your personal transaction database, and the other one is the aggregate database. So your personal transaction database becomes your personal identity, it becomes your certification record, it becomes your, your, your personal history, it becomes your CV. The aggregate database is what banks and insurance companies will go to in order to solve their risk problems. In order to go there, they have to buy the mass tokens from the engineers who hold them. So you see how we've created a, a market where if you want to access this rich engineering data, which is arch archived all the important stuff in the world, you have to buy these mass tokens. The only way to get them are from the engineers who hold them. And in that form, you're measuring value into existence. Okay, so this is, this is the thesis, this is the theory. Um, so we're saying the, intrinsic, the engineering token has intrinsic value, and there's no token that can say that. So this is pretty uh, interesting. It's still, we're, we're running it now. We've got a, a test chain up. We've got a fantastic community. Uh, it's getting larger, um, and we're, we're, we have a community practice in a couple of very large firms, um, and we're associated with a, a, other consortia. You know, we, we have to work together. I mean, there's just this school of thought that says, if I can be the next, you know, black market currency, when the token falls down, I'll take over the world. I mean, that's just not the way to think about this, okay? Not even. And I've actually seen VC get up on stage and say that exact same, the, the exact thing. And whatever, it's just not the right, it's not our, your engineer is telling you it's not the recommended approach, okay? That's, that's <laughs> all I'm going to say. Um, so these are the, the people who are, the organizations we're working with. Um, Jacobs Engineering, Arab, ASCE, CH2M, uh, Purdue, uh, NAIC. So these are all people who have helped us with our research and given us data whose people are on our, um, on our team building this thing and whose use cases we're, we're, we're incorporating in, in the process. That pretty much says, uh, here's a disclaimer I go by it really quick. Um, no, it's, it's, it's not a problem. Oh, so we're, we're um, it's not gonna go back. So we are a utility token. And like you said, we'd had to jump through all kinds of hoops to stay out of the SEC. And we actually have the, the, the chain is in Switzerland. Um, the consortium is a uh, Delaware C Corp. And then we've got several other um, satellites, one in Seattle, um, or actually two in Seattle. So uh, we've had to jump through hoops to get that done. Um, the EOS blockchain, uh, we like that ecosystem. It's fast, super fast. It's uh, the throughput's magnificent. Um, and there's interoperability among all the heritage coins, or at least there will be. Um, and and that, that's what we're banking on. We, we just couldn't do this on Ethereum. We just could not do it on Bitcoin. We would like to, but it just wasn't going to happen. Um, are there any, any questions? Questions? I could just drop it right there. Yes, sir. Um, what stage are you at? Have you deployed? Is the, is, the, is the chain running? Yes, the chain is running. We have a test net running right now. We are producing blocks. We are inputting data. We are doing the votes. We could, there's a few priorities. We have to have our um, we have to have a, a way to exchange um, the M tokens internally on a P2P on a quid pro quo level. That's going to be the first step towards you know spitting it out. So um, yeah, this is we're, we're, we're working on it now. Do you so and so your main do you know what your main net launch will be and what you also have? I think Steam has uh, 17 witnesses. Is that or okay, well, it, how, does that, is, how does that work on your system? Well, I, we can use as many witnesses as we want. Okay. I think I think Dan Larimer said the ideal is 21, which would be the minimum, but you could have hundreds of witnesses. Sure. Um, what we're doing, which is interesting, is we are going to, um, our witnesses, we're, we're going to be giving some of them away to institutions, like the National Association right. of Insurance Commission. So that, you know, the money is supported by the institutions, which validate who, in whose best interest it is to keep the Here's money. The buy in. Right. Well, you know, if, if you if I rip you off, you go to the to the institution of, of the law enforcement, yeah. and they come and they and they execute. I mean, they execute that warrant and they take return the money to you. So you know, you can't do it without the institutions, like the treasury. I mean, so what we would use are the engineering institutions, like the ASME or, or the ASCE, or, or and try to get that kind of buy in some universities and come up with some sort of roading scenario schedule. But that's where we're going to probably put. I mean, I, that's just a, a thought right now, but we're working on that. Those are questions for governance issues. Yeah. Any, any other questions? Yes, sir. So I, I didn't totally understand the mass and gravity token. Thing, okay. But uh, there, there's one thing specifically that I was curious about, and this is something um, 
that I find is a big problem right now with cryptocurrencies is that any any cryptocurrency that's used as a utility token on a network, if the currency value doubles, but the number of tokens required to complete an action on that network remains the same, anybody who didn't already have fiat in that system as a cryptocurrency now pays double for the same function as they would have prior to the price. So volatility of the currency affects the price of doing any transaction. Like if Apple stock doubled and you had to pay with stock to buy an iPhone, the price of your iPhone is now twice as much tomorrow. Um, and so it sounded like there might have been some disentanglement with with mass and gravity tokens that would prevent that sort of happening. But I yeah. want to clarification on that. Well, so there's a, certain, there's a mechanism. So if, if suppose there's a, the, the insurance industry anticipates a heavy storm season and just big storms are going to come and wipe out Atlanta. They're going to purchase a lot of these tokens because they're going to need engineers to go and assess the damage after the storm. So they're going to hoard the currency. So that's going to start bringing the price up. As soon as you do that, all the engineers are going to say, hey, wait a minute, there's a good price on these things. I'm going to start bloating more content into that database. And they start bringing the price back down. So it's always going to be, it's, always going to be, it's not going to be an artificial stability device. I've seen a lot of coins used to start, they print and stuff more to make it even. Well, this is going to be more organic. Um, we do expect there to be a pretty high premium because there's a lot of risk that needs to be removed from the world system. I mean, a lot of risk, like global warming. I mean, that's an easy problem to solve. I mean, engineers can solve that. But anyway, I won't, I won't debate that. But when we get all the, all the important problems that need to be solved are solved, then your inflation is going to probably reflect natural entropy. You know how natural entropy systems things want to decay at a certain rate. You know, so eventually it'll, it'll level out, but not probably for a while. But you'll you'll see that yes. So, but but to his point, so the so as as the value of the token goes up, right? Then engineers would be able to price their service similar services at a lower price in token. Is that? Well, the, or would they always or would they always or would, would a certain would a certain service always have a certain sort of token price? Well, it's going to be sort of like you know, you're going to exist in a real world still. So they're creating stuff in the real world. They're going to be, it's like their resume, they're going to put, it's like their LinkedIn, they're going to put their projects onto the system and, cre and, and create a second revenue source. Mm -hmm. So they have the regular jobs, or they can make that their primary revenue source. I'm not going to tell them how to game the game, but they would, if they see, if, if the price of the tokens is going up, they're going to participate more actively. And it's really contingent on the value of that database, and you have to have, has to be comprehensive. Remember I said there's holes in the insurance market where well, you can't have those holes. It's better to have a thin layer completely filled than to have these, these big you know, channels of deep information. So they're going to be finding these layers to fill them in, and that's going to be yielding them tokens. So it's, it's going to be analytical. They'll be able to understand where to apply. But they can have price competition. So, so Ava, could, Ava and I are both engineers in the system, and, I, and she could charge 10 tokens, and I can charge 8 tokens for a similar system? For well, similar if somebody uses, if somebody uses or, your, your participation more, like if you get 15 verifica verifications and she gets 2, then that's, you know, the stake, your stake is going to increase, and okay. you're going to receive more tokens. So it's, it's, a game, token. it's a game between the stake, the gravity, and the mass. It's a, right. a multi-agent algorithmic game. So if you multiply them, you get an asset. If you divide them, something else happens. If you take the inverse, and if you put them in if and or statements, other things happen. That's what quantitative analysis right. is all about. So are you imagining a price discovery uh, for services, um, smart contract within that ecosystem? We're going to make a market, and the, and the market's okay. going to tell us what their price is. But it should resolve to essentially an engineer making royalties on their work. And if they make very useful work, then they're going to get more royalties. So again, it's a market. It's a game. And we're structuring it so that it sort of flips the turtle over, and we don't have a, a risk maximizing world, we have a risk minimizing world, and, and that's how we're going to hedge that thing. It's a big vision, but it also works on a small scale. I mean, it's an everyday basis, people are trading this stuff anyway, so hopefully that'll, that'll work out. Exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.